everyone. Thank you for joining me on this episode of the SCAR Initiative. I'm so excited to have my friend Kristen here with us. I met Kristen a couple of weeks ago, actually, uh, for the first time at Miss Better in America, the 10th anniversary, and we really connected and just hit it off from there. So Kristen and I got a chance to really talk about what I'm doing and what she's doing. And Kristen has her own show, Breaking Barriers, which airs on Thursday, November 25th, my episode, everybody, and a few other episodes after that, so or a few other dates. But I'm excited to be able to talk to Kristen about her story. So I'll turn it over to Kristen to give an introduction about herself. All right, Kristen. Thank you, Lindsay. Hi, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to uh, Lindsay's uh, episode of the SCAR Initiative tonight. Uh, so, uh, Lindsay mentioned my name is Kristen Leone. I live in New Jersey. Uh, I am uh, 45 years old. Uh, my birthday is next month. Uh, my son is 19 years old, and uh, I have been a nurse for 23 years, and I have been in the Navy Nurse Corps for 10 years, and I had a deployment to Afghanistan in 2015. And uh, just for funsies, I also have a fourth degree black belt, and I think I'm up to nine <laughs> tattoos now. <laughs> no big deal, just a badass. <laughs> wow. You definitely stay busy, it sounds like, between work, personal life. I mean, you just, you do it all. You're, you're the modern woman. I'm yeah, you know, I don't like to sit still. I've never liked to sit still. And, you know, my mom had to laugh at me because I got my master's degree uh, three years ago, two and a half years ago from <laughs> Drexel University. And she's like, what are you going to do with yourself now? I'm like, I don't know. I'm sure something will present itself. <laughs> and, you know, lo and behold, a pandemic hit. And I was sitting home going, I was going from work to home and that was it. And that's right. no bueno for someone like myself who's a social butterfly. I'm like, I need something to do. Yeah. And I found this veteran America. And so that's kind of what started me in the veteran advocacy arena. And then what's what led me oh. to meeting some uh, amazing women uh, like yourself. Yeah. So I just, you know, I'm one of those people that preaches, take risks and lean mm -hmm. into the fear because you never know where it's going to lead you. That's amazing. And that's such a good, important concept to remind people of, because I think we forget about taking the risk because we're so scared of that unknown. But the worst you, that could happen is nothing happens, I guess, right. where you just completely fall flat on your face and you figure out that either this is for you or it's not, and you just keep up and try again. So. And that's what we do as women in the military too, yeah. right? We adapt and exactly. overcome and we just yeah. move on. It's just yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Well, I am so excited for you to share your story. Yours is one that we've never had yet. And so I'm excited to be able to share that with women who are going to be hearing your story because it's a really, really important topic that should be discussed. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the scar, scars, I suppose, that you have chosen to highlight, the significance of them for you how this occurred, anything important that you want to include about your story. Oh, th thank you. Uh, I'm going to try to, um, I guess, compartmentalize it in that. Um, so I was never telling the whole story of, you know, a period of my life, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so I got divorced from my first husband and you know, I was dating and met a younger man and, you know, thought, oh, he's young and he's got energy and he seems like he's, you know, romantic and et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, it turned into, you know, Dr. Jekyll turned into Mr. Hyde or however you want to say it. Um, and I spent, you know, many years in an abusive marriage. And, you know, when I was younger growing up, you know, you would hear about these stories and, you would think, why didn't she leave him? And the truth is once I was in it, you're like, you just don't know how to get out because mm -hmm. of the, how they twist your mind into thinking it's your fault or you can't do, or you just become almost a shell of your former self. And at least that's how I felt. And I just didn't know how to get out. And the funny thing was, you know, I was with this person for five years. And while I was with this person, I also had four miscarriages and I, 
you know, just kind of pocketed that all up and kind of dealt with it. Mm -hmm. And, or so I thought, and struggled with the miscarriage of these losses for many years. And finally, you know, um, this past winter in January, I was able to process that grief fully and let go. And if I knew then what I know now, mm -hmm. um, like I, and I don't even know if, if I was ready for it at the time, um, but it, I just found it interesting that um, there's there was a series out on Netflix now called Made, and it's about a woman who leaves her abusive relationship, mm -hmm. and I was watching it, and yes, I mean th this relationship ended uh, back in 2012. So it's been almost 10 years since I, I've been out of this relationship. And I have, you know, like I said, I've been to therapy for it and processed, but it was really interesting for me to watch the things that this woman was going through. And every night that I was watch, like binge watching like multiple episodes in a row, I was just mm -hmm. like sobbing and calling my boyfriend and saying like, I don't know how I got out. Like, I don't know how I got out. I don't know right. how I survived. I don't know how I rebuilt myself afterwards. It's just, so I kind of feel like I'm like reprocessing so that like I, because the funny thing was, like I said, that I spent years kind of not talking about that marriage and that period of my life because it was, hurtful. It was painful. It was almost embarrassing for me that I got married again and I was wound up in this, you know, abusive relationship and everybody knew me as a badass. Like, oh, she never afraid to speak her opinion. Like, you know, don't, she's super strong. And I wound up in this relationship completely sheltered and isolated from people and really not feeling strong. And then to kind of see it as it, you know, kind of what it must have looked like, mm -hmm. it just, it blew me away. And like I said, I spent many nights kind of sobbing and my boyfriend, you know, currently said, he's like, well, he, he's like, you know how you got out. You had this moment in a, a hospital orientation where they were talking about different kinds of abuse. And it just went, I went, oh my God, I'm in an abusive marriage. Oh, <laughs> and nice. I, called my mom and said, Hey, um, I'm, uh, I'm, we're going to have a sleepover because my mom already had my, this, so this goes back many years. Mm -hmm. Um, I was starting a job and I was still with this person and in hospital orientation, I have this light bulb moment. And I knew he, I had tried to get out and couldn't get out. And I knew that night he was working late and I called my mom and said, Hey, I'll, I'm coming home from work. I'm packing a bag and I'll be over. And she already had my son. So she was like, okay. And, um, I was like, I'm, uh, this is, this is, this is it. This is my chance to get out. And, you know, she kind of helped facilitate the, the legal things and the conversations that needed to be had with him. And I was like, you basically have two weeks to find a place, pack your shit and get out. Cause mm -hmm. I'm done. Like we're done with this. Right. And I'm not dealing with this anymore. And like I said, I don't know how I got, I mean, obviously the situation presented itself that I had this moment of it's gotta be now and I have to go mm -hmm. and then spend the next several years kind of rebuilding myself. So it was just, like I said, I, at the time processing it, but kind of looking back now, reevaluating that, because like I said, I saw it ha like to see it on TV is of what it must have looked like with me mm -hmm. in the situation was just mind blowing. I almost feel like I was reliving it. It was so, it hit so close to home in so many scenes that I just went, oh, this is what it must have looked like. Holy shit. Wow. And you know, like I said, I spent years kind of hiding that part of it. And I never really talked about the miscarriages either. And over time, in, here and there, people have been placed in my path that have kind of like piece at a time kind of helped me realize some things. Um, but I was still carrying that grief of the losses. Mm -hmm. And last year, while I was advocating for Miss Veteran America, 
um, I was introduced to a gentleman who uh, was former army, but it was also a minister. And we both kind of felt at the time that we, there, was a, there was a bigger reason that the both of us had met. Yeah. And he wound up being very instrumental in um, me processing my grief in addition to another person that I had met, but all through my advocacy for Ms. Veteran America. So, you know, for me, did I want to get involved and get off the couch? Absolutely. But I think that journey for me was bigger than the contest itself. And, yeah. you know, um, the one organization, they have Zoom meetings three times a week at night for uh, military, law enforcement, first responders. And I happened to be on the call one night because I was feeling a, this sense of loss from these, the miscarriages. And, mm -hmm. You know, I was trying to find a way to process the grief and my other friend that I had met said, look, I have a friend who has a funeral home because I've, after the first miscarriage, they gave me a bear. And it's like, oh, that's a nice consolation prize. I don't have my baby, but I have a bear. That's great, right? So I carried it around for 10 years because I didn't know what to do with it, right? Like I didn't want to put it, like give it away because that didn't feel right. I didn't want to just leave it somewhere because that didn't feel right. So I spent years kind of basically carrying this grief around with me. Mm. And my friend who was a minister said, well, what, what do we do with the dead? And I was like, well, will we bury them. Like, where am I going to bury this bear that's got any kind of meaning to me? And I said, what is my happy place is the beach, but it doesn't feel right to leave the bear at the right. beach because of what it represents. Right. And that's when he said to me, I have a friend who owns a funeral home. I've spoken with her and she said, she's happy to take the bear for you and cremate it and give you the ashes, whatever, however much there may be. And you are free to do with them what you will. Mm -hmm. So I had to spend some time processing that. And that's when I went online to my friends, other friends group yeah. and saying like, I know I need to do this, but I don't know how, and I don't know how to do it by myself. And he was like, well, that's BS. Like, you're not going by yourself. Like, I'll go with you myself. So it was really kind of a community effort to kind of help me process this grief mm -hmm. because I've been starting to talk about the miscarriages, but this minister friend of mine said, you have a story to tell and I know you want to help people, but you're not telling the whole story. And I was like, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you're, yes, you're processing the grief of the loss of your children. He's like, but what else happened in that, that time period? He's like, you're, yeah. there's still value to the struggle of both. And he's like, you're a survivor, you're a domestic violence survivor, and you need to be telling the whole story and not just a piece of it. Yeah. And I said, well, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, I guess you're right. <laughs> so I've been starting to talk about it because like I said, I'm, I'm the woman that, you know, breaks the glass ceiling. I was the right. first woman in my family to serve my country, the first woman to deploy. And, you know, I felt that it gave, it lessened my image. And he kind of said to me, no, it strengthens that image. He's like, we all have our moments where we, you know, we think things are one and they're not. And he's like, think about this. He's like, you're a woman, you're a nurse. He's like, you're just, you have a trusting nature and you trusted yeah. someone. He's like, I don't want you to lose that piece of yourself. He's like, and we don't want other people to fall into the same trap either. So you need to tell your story. And he's like, it makes people relate to you more, particularly in your mission. He's like, you're advocating now for women veterans. He said, you're, you know, that you could be like, your struggle could be somebody else's playbook. He's, you know, you have to talk about it. And so why well, don't want to talk about it? Cause it's hard, right? <laughs> natural to want to shut down and not want to say anything exactly exactly but um I think about you know was it awful and hard yes um but I also have to think about um you know I did have that moment where I went oh I need to get out and now is the time like because mm -hmm. every battered woman I think they try to find that perfect moment and yeah there really isn't a perfect moment, but there's going to be an opportunity where go now and, you know, ask for, and ask for help. And I think yeah. that was part of my problem too. I'm that person that 
I, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to figure it out. I don't care what it takes and, you know, don't want to ask for help. And how's it going to look and how are people going to perceive me? Yeah. And uh, I think it was probably the period of my life that was the hardest lesson for me to learn is asking for help is not a sign of weakness. And that was a big point that I had to keep telling myself for a while as I was rebuilding myself. It's like, you're not weak. You, you hit a rough patch and you fell and you're rebuilding yourself and it's okay to ask people to help pick you up on the journey. Mm -hmm. And then once you're on your feet, then you can turn around and help somebody else coming up behind you. Like that's how this works. It's not, you know, one and done. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. That is an incredible story. <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, you have such a strength in being able to discuss this because miscarriage with domestic violence, that is just a combination I can't even imagine having to experience and four miscarriages at that. How did you cope with that during that marriage that you were a, a victim in? Um... I think I, I just kind of process it at, at, in, in drips and drabs because I don't think I really had the mental strength to process the miscarriages because of everything that was going on because like I had my own son to take care of and my then husband wasn't working. So I was working so much just to pay the bills. And at one point, you know, I, I've had those, per those periods during that time where I had to make a decision, what bill am I not paying because I have to buy groceries. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just working a lot. And then he was spending money on alcohol left and right. And uh, uh, twice I had to apply to the state for two different grants to pay um, my electric bill and my gas bill mm -hmm. uh, because we just didn't have the money. And the arguments over why aren't you paying my student loans? So, well, I'm not paying your student loans because I have to pay my student loans. I'm, you know, my they're in my parents' name and I have to pay them. I understand that you have loans too, but they're in your name. Like you need to figure that out. You need to get a job and figure it out because I can, I mean, I was working six and seven days a week sometimes mm -hmm. um, just to pay the mortgage and, keep the lights on and, you know, keep food on the table and clothes on our backs. And I said, I can't work any more than I already am. And, you know, the first miscarriage came as, you know, I thought everything was fine. You know, I was as a nurse, I'm like, Oh, as long as I'm puking and I feel like crap, you know, I'm, and my boobs mm -hmm. are sore, like, Oh, if I'm feeling everything, everything's okay. So, right. but it's also, you know, a curse too, because when you go for the ultrasound, you know what you're supposed to be looking for. And you're all of a sudden you're just kind of look thinking to yourself, like, well, wait a minute, something's missing. Where's the heartbeat? And, you know, they have to tell you what you kind of already know just by looking. And it's so, it's just so impersonal, you know, because you're, yeah you have to have blood work and then they have to put this, they, they call it a lamp. Basically it's like a seaweed tampon and it absorbs mm -hmm. moisture. So it, you know, naturally kind of dilates your cervix. So they don't have to do so much in the operating room. So that's kind of invasive. And then the second miscarriage he actually caused because he pushed me and I fell backwards over a chair and I had to have the procedure again. And I guess the blessing in the process was that the next two miscarriages happened on their own. Um, but I was also trying to get pregnant at the time too. So I was going through all this fertility stuff and the hormones were making me insane. And I was constantly getting like blood work and transvaginal ultrasounds. And there was always somebody like in my space. Mm -hmm. So it just becomes this, I don't even know how to describe it. You're just, you, you want it so bad, yeah. but at the same time, you, so it, it wasn't enough just to have the miscarriages. It was, I'm investing like literally blood, <laughs> sweat right. and tears and nothing is coming of it. And you're, you're sick of people being, like I said, in your personal space and then things aren't working out and you have to go to the hospital and people are in your personal space. And it's, 
So there was just so much to process. But by the fourth one, I was, I mean, I think that I was legitimately suicidal because the pain is so great. You just wanted to stop. Mm -hmm. And I used to get, again, I never used to understand why people committed suicide until the fourth miscarriage. And I'm like, this is why, because it hurts so bad that you just wanted to stop and you don't know any other way to do it. Cause there's no amount of alcohol or drugs because mm -hmm. once you sober up, it's still there. So you have yeah. to deal with it. So I dealt with it as best I could, you know, moment to moment. And mm -hmm. I also had my son to take care of. And I was also working a lot. Um, I also come from a family that's, you know, just keep moving. Don't stop and think about it. But I don't think that does anybody any good when you kind of shove things down. So like I said, I dealt with it little by little over time. And then once I had kind of finally rebuilt myself, I spent some more time delving into the relationship and the losses and trying to get over it. And then I got a tattoo at some point of, um, it's supposed to be like me crying with like four feathers that have fallen around it. And I thought that would help me heal. Um, and it did to a certain extent, um, but not completely. It really took this multi-year journey and just meeting the right people and somebody helping me process in a way that was meaningful to yeah. fully get over it. I mean, I can honestly, if, I, I, I mean, this all happened in like December, January. And I mean, since January of this year, I don't think I've really struggled to talk about it since mm -hmm. then. I was like, dang, I should have done this like 10 years ago. <laughs> but again, right. I don't think that, I mean, I needed to be ready and all the pieces needed mm -hmm. to be there. And I think it was just, you know, competing for Miss Bet in America was fun. And of course we all want to win. But for me, I don't think that contest had anything to do with winning the contest and had everything to do with what else is that it is going to be put in my path to put me in a certain direction. Yep. So that A, I can process my grief and be stronger and B, be a voice to others and you know it's just led to all all different other things that have come you know come from that so um and it was just funny because um and when i took the bear my friend and his girlfriend came with me yeah. and i had wrapped it in one of my old um shirts that i wore you know they retired the blueberries so the t-shirts that we wore um i still had a bunch of them laying around so yeah. I wrapped it in one of my old t-shirts and I dropped it off. And then, um, of course it was in Philadelphia and I have a truck and I cannot parallel park to save my life. <laughs> um, so, um, that was stressing me out a little bit, but she, the woman who, um, was in charge of the funeral home said, I'm going to put the cones out front for you. So you can just pull up and park. And I was like, um, okay. <laughs> oh. well, one less thing for me to stress about. Yes. And you know, she called me and then my other friend came with me and picked it up and she was very honest with me. She said, get it. Cause it was like a, like a stuffed bear. Like it gets about like this big. Huh. She's like, I don't know how much we're going to get. She's like, but you know, even if we get a little bit, she's like, I want to be able to give you, I'm sure I can give you something. I'm like, that's all that I want is something. And I wound up getting mm -hmm. like, you know, like a cup of decent size of, mm -hmm. you know, of ashes. And, you know, it sat on my nightstand for a couple of weeks thinking about, you know, when I would go and what I would do and should I do it by myself or should I go with someone? And um, so we, I went with my boyfriend to the beach, um, to Ocean City, New Jersey, which is, like I said, my happy place. And yeah, um, right before it, he was talking about um, the movie, The Big Lebowski, if you've ever seen it, mm -hmm. he goes to spread his friend's ashes and they all kind of blow back on him. And I was like, ha ha. And like, right when I start pouring that, like in my hand, like the wind, like all of a sudden kicks up and like starts <laughs> blowing them back at me. And so I kind of started to laugh <laughs> as I'm walking towards the water to kind of like lay the ashes in the ocean. So it wound up being, you know, like a funny moment, but it like I appreciated the humor in the moment and yeah, it, yeah. Um, 
you know, my boyfriend, I'm like, just take one picture for me of the ashes in my hand. He's like, literally one. The whole point of this is for you to let go. It's like oh. not to look back. Right. So, and, and he was right, but I just have one picture and I'm glad I have that one picture. Um, and then the, the container, he's like, now you're throwing that container out. Right. And I was like, well, he's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, again, this is about closure. This is about peace and about moving forward. He's like, you need yes. to throw the container out. I said, okay. And I thought I would struggle afterwards, but I really mm-hmm. didn't, you know? And then we went and walked on the boardwalk and I bought a pair of earrings to kind of, you know, make commit, you know, kind of commemorate the occasion and make something, you know, you know, retail therapy always makes us happy. Of course. <laughs> um, and so, you know, and now every time I wear the earrings, I think, you know, this was, you know, it was a beautiful beach day and I, you know, the weather was clear and mm-hmm. um, it was just a nice, beautiful day to kind of take a step back and make peace with, you know, a painful part of my life, but move forward. And I mean, I have, it's, it's made a huge difference these last 11 months Wow, uh, I have to say, um, you know, the shoes that I sent you the picture of, mm-hmm. um, I bought those probably the, um, a month after I divorced my second husband. Uh, and I bought them for two reasons. One, because I wanted something beautiful yeah. um, to make to feel good about myself. And two, red is a power of um, power color. Yep. And um, they were, I think I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I think I might've paid like $250 for those shoes. Um, but I bought them because it was Christmas and my birthday. And I actually had the money yes. to do something frivolous and fun because he was no longer around awesome. spending money frivolously on things. And yes. I could afford things that I wanted. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, every once in a while I take them out and I look at them and I think, <laughs> okay. You know, like when things start getting a little hairy or crazy, and I'm like, no, yeah. just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you got this, that. you got the shoes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the show for it. <laughs> That's fantastic. What an awesome way to find a way to cope. I would never have thought about cremation for a, an item. I mean, that is a real, you bring up such a good situation of what do you do what do you do I mean it how how did you feel like it was a peaceful moment as soon as the the minister mentioned that did it just kind of click like yes I I get it that's what I need to do well because we were talking about well so the whole thing started because he's a minister and one of the he because he, we had been having discussions about how I walked away from the church many years ago Mm -hmm. and I don't tell the story a lot, but I mentioned to my friend because he's a minister. And I said, well, I was struggling with the miscarriages. I was really in a dark place and we were in church one day and I went to the priest and said, I'm struggling. I need to talk to someone. And he basically blamed me and said, well, my dear, and the, I know in the eyes of the law, you're met, you're divorce but in the eyes of God you're still married so you need to come talk to me about annulment I said wait wait a minute time out let me let me get this straight father my miscarriages are my fault because I am still married in the eyes of the church (laughs) so I need to come see you about an annulment an annulment got it okay deuces (laughs) yeah I I walked away (laughs) and my friend who's a minister he said I am so sorry that happened to you because that never should have been a comment out of a man of the cloth to a a parishioner who was clearly struggling. Mm -hmm. And he said, and that's when we had this conversation about what do we do with the dead? And I said, well, we bury them. And I said, I just don't know where to bury it because I don't know any place where I could bury it that would have meaning for me other than the beach. And again, it would get dug up or to just leave it in a spot. Again, it represents my children. I can't leave it and walk away from it. I've been carrying it around for 10 years. So I said, I would love to cremate it, but I don't know where to take it. And I've made a couple calls to like pet crematories Mm -hmm. and they said, oh no, we don't do that. And then I had called somebody like an actual 
cream, crematory for humans. And they said, oh, we don't do that. Why would we do that? I'm like, because I'm, <laughs> okay. <laughs> not clearly not everybody carries this. How can I help my fellow man out um, yeah. mentality? Um, and when I was explaining this to him, you know, a few weeks later, he said, I have a friend who owns a funeral home. Let me make a phone call. And he called me back and he said, she is more than happy to help you. She won't even charge you. Um, and she's like, she just wants to help you heal. And I was like, well, that's very nice. So, and my friend and his girlfriend came with me the day that I dropped it off. And I think just knowing that I had someone there to support me yeah. made a big difference. And it didn't feel, I thought it was going to feel terrifying to hand it over to somebody else, but it really, it didn't. So I think for me, the, the sense of peace that I was feeling or the lack of, um, I guess, terror or um, pain or sadness, I wasn't feeling any of that. So I said, this must be what's supposed to be because I'm not feeling negative about the situation. And then mm -hmm. Even once I got the little cup back of the ashes and had them on my nightstand, I went, oh, okay. Like mm. it wasn't this overwhelming sense of sadness. Yeah. It was just, okay, this is okay. Mm -hmm. And I think I just needed a couple of weeks to really kind of go, okay, this is what I want to do. And I, right. cause I have been saying, I really feel like I want to cremate it and spread the ashes in a place that has meaning for me mm -hmm. and so to actually be able to, you know, to do it, I think was, it was just the final piece of, I can, now I can breathe and really move on with my life. So it, it wasn't, you know, like I said, I was terrified of that moment, but when it came, it wasn't as terrifying as I thought it was going to be. So for me, that was, this is, okay, this is right. So, yeah. and then I just kind of, you know, followed it to its natural end and, like I said, it's, I, it's, it made such a huge difference in the way that I have felt these last several months. And I even um, did an episode of my show, Breaking Barriers, because uh, October is perinatal loss and infant uh, loss awareness month. Mm -hmm. um, and I did an entire episode with my, with two of my friends who also had miscarriages and we just kind of had an open discussion about our experiences and you know kind of you know create it created the space for the conversations to occur yeah. because it is one of those things where people don't know what to say yeah and really what we just want to hear as women who experience these losses is that they they were our children from the minute you pee on a stick they're your child and mm -hmm. i'm sorry for your loss and really mm -hmm. if that's all you say then that's really all that we need and give us time for the healing and again open the space for the conversation to happen mm -hmm. when we're ready and 10 years later i feel like i'm kind of ready to tell the whole story about you know the domestic violence in the marriage and the miscarriages that resulted thereof and how I kind of got out and rebuilt myself. That's, that is just fantastic. I mean, it clearly hearing you tell your story shows that these scars have impacted you both physically, mentally, spiritually. I mean, you name it. So how do you feel like it impacted you then to where you're at now? Um, I think there, you know, I definitely, before all this, completion of healing, I would have moments where I would just at randomly cry or get really angry that I had experienced this and mm -hmm. why me? And, you know, I don't feel that any anymore. Like, am I sad? And do I think about them all the time? Absolutely. But I'm in a space where I can have these conversations because I think they're important to have. And, mm -hmm. you know, I need to acknowledge that, you know, the reality is I am a domestic violence survivor and mm -hmm. I make sure to point that out, the survivor piece of it. Um, I'm not a victim by any stretch of the right. imagination. And, you know, when you experience these losses, you feel like you're the only one going through it. And it's just, it's terrifying. It is sad. It is, it's, if you're going through fertility stuff and it's happening, it is, doubly frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to stay connected as women in our experiences, just like, 
you and I and all the women that have been in the military, we know the struggle of wearing all the 50 pounds of gear and being in the field and just, you know, look, you get your period and you, you got to go into the port of John and do what you got to do. You know, like, right. we, <laughs> we stay yeah. connected mm -hmm. through our shared experiences, the yeah. good and the bad. So if we're going to celebrate each other when we are being successful and we're doing good things to help the community, like you are with this project, those are all wonderful things, but we also need to stay connected when we're in the shit. And yeah. if, you know, hey, I'm here for you. This must have sucked. And I'm really sorry that you went through that. I went through something similar. Uh, look, if you need to cry, you need to vent. I'm here because I went through it too. You know, I have a, you know, I don't, I mean, I have a deeper understanding as a human being now of when people say that they're struggling and they're depressed. Yeah. Because I was at that point in my life where it hurts so damn bad. You, the only thing that you could think to do is to kill yourself because nothing else is going to make it stop. Yeah. So I, when somebody says that to me, or I hear someone say that I can go, I understand that feeling. Let's talk about it because ultimately as humans, we don't want to think that we, we don't want to feel that we're alone ever in, especially when we're things are going, going bad. Right. So if we know that somebody else went through it and we've got a battle buddy, it makes it so much easier to have those conversations and feel supported and then move forward and build the life that you want. Like nobody wants to stay down in the dirt and be no. down. But if we start being honest about when we're going through the bad times and asking for help, we're going to realize that there's more people around us that want to help and can help us. And then we can then in turn help others. There's just, there's just too much negativity and drama going around right now. It's like, can we all just get along and <laughs> learn to help each other, please, for God's sake. Agreed. Agreed. It's amazing to me to think that we know we don't want to suffer alone. We want somebody to say, I, I get it. I empathize with you, but we are so terrified to reach out and ask for help because it has been stigmatized that you're weak. If you do that, or you're not very strong mentally. However, <laughs> that has been explained to you by trying to be honest. It's just been really shot down year after year after year since the world was created it seems like we've never had this true honest conversation about what is it like to suffer and I love knowing that you are playing such a huge part in this change and facilitating <laughs> these conversations and and saying look I've been through some crazy shit I I get it I mean, miscarriages, domestic violence, you may have things on the horizon that you would never expect years down the road. But the fact that you are talking about it now tells me that I feel like you will be okay. <laughs> it'll, <laughs> it'll, it'll be tough. That's not to say that, but you've got the coping skills. So can you, can you tell us about the healing journey of these scars? Um, it was... I mean, look, you have, anytime you go through anything traumatic, whether, you know, it's, it's being deployed, it's being, you know, it, you know, carjacked, it's any mm -hmm. kind of traumatic experience. It doesn't matter what it is. You have to do the work, like you have to get professional counseling from, from a therapist. Yeah. Um, you have to talk to someone and you have to feel the pain. <laughs> it's the mm -hmm. only way it works. <laughs> and I know a lot of people Turns, that's why they turn to drugs and alcohol because they don't want to feel it, mm -hmm. but it's also because it's not in a controlled environment and in the right situation. Now, mm -hmm. should you be, you know, at, you know, uh, at, you know, getting your nails done and all of a sudden you're breaking down because you like something triggers you No, but in the confines of a therapist and, you know, working through the emotions and the feelings, you learn to process them in a positive way yeah. and move past them because ultimately it leads to more suffering if you don't process it and you wind up making the people around you suffer and then you wind up isolating yourself. And then it just kind of, you get stuck like in the vortex of hell and mm -hmm. uh, you know, with no way out. So 
for me, it was definitely processing it, you know, with a therapist and ultimately accepting that I can't do it all. None of us can. And we need to ask for help. And it's okay to ask for help, even though, you know, I don't care if you're, you know, six foot five and, you know, built like, you know, built like the rock or you're five foot and, you know, you're just a petite little thing. It doesn't matter. We all have our own level of strength. And at some point we all need to ask for help. So that's been my message is that what got me through the hardest times in these last 10 years was slowly in like drips and drabs, asking for help and helping others by telling my story. Um, even though it was in drips and drabs uh, up until recently. And, you know, now I'm telling the whole story so that, you know, more people can learn and we can understand, you know, some of where we, you know, uh, and understand each other mm-hmm. a little bit better and respect each other a little bit better. And, you know, for me being a woman who's, you know, kind of in, is in the community uh, and is very visible and out in the community doing things and helping others, um, you know, people will stay, you know, they see me, I'm smiling all the time and I'm trying to make everybody laugh and feel comfortable and take care of everyone. And, you know, they see like, oh, she's got a bachelor's degree. Oh, she's got a master's degree. Oh, she was the head of the Philadelphia Veterans Day Parade. And they see all these things that I'm out doing, but I want people to understand that I'm here because I worked for it. And I'm here because, you know, I've, I've kind of suffered and been through it and I've moved past it. So I don't want people to see me and think that I got there. It wasn't easy for me. I went through, you know, I did work for all the success that I've had, but I've also suffered through, you know, some drama and I've all, I've got past it and I want someone to go, Oh, she did it. So I can do it. Or I'm going through it. Right. And maybe somebody's hiding their truth about what they're going through and don't want to talk about it, but they may hear, Oh, she's you know she got through x y and z yeah so she did it you know okay i can do it or maybe they come to me and ask for help and i say well i don't know how to help you with this but i may maybe i know someone who can so if we open the door and allow people to have conversations and allow them to ask for help there's just no telling what we can do when we all start supporting each other amen (laughs) <laughs> I wish it was just that easy. I know, right? <laughs> I know. I have to laugh because everybody, they see me and they, they know about, you know, like I have a, you know, all, all I go to the range of my guns and the tattoos right. and the fourth degree back belt. And they're like, oh, she's kind of like a badass. I'm like, but I have this very Mr. Rogers view of the world. <laughs> you have a very sensitive side that is yeah, so Yeah, I do, yeah. It definitely, it, it radiates. It, it just feels magnetic to be able to, to talk to. You're very easy to communicate with and to, to share, you know, things with as it comes out. And you're just like, well, let me tell Kristen everything. She just seems like <laughs> <laughs> a very healing, positive uh, person. And I think that being able to show, share with people, it hasn't been easy. I have suffered. My life has not been perfect. Nobody's has. But let me be honest about who I am. Right. So with that being said, what message or takeaway would you want somebody who's hearing your story to to learn from? Um, I think that I would love for people to learn that um, that you can do amazing things. Uh, You just have to believe in yourself and you have to push through. And if you are in a domestic violence situation, there's gonna be that moment where you can go and ask for help and just make sure you're safe. And if you have children, make sure they're safe and everything else will fall into place because you can always make more money. You can always find another place. I know the system was a little you know, messed up, but ultimately your safety and health and your children's safety and health is, you know, is top priority. Yeah, but get through all that because there is so much waiting for you on the other side of the drama and of the pain. There's so much else out there. And um, I don't know. I just, I think about, you know, you know, I was running again, all the things that have been com- all the good things that have come from just, just entering a contest because I was feeling isolated during the pandemic mm-hmm. and I was running from his veteran America simply because I was, 
lonely yeah. and I met, I made so many new friends from it. And at, during my advocacy, I got offered to have my own TV show and it's such fun. <laughs> and I get to have all kinds of guests on my show who are doing good things in the community. Um, and I have a diversity of guests, including multiple veterans who still, even though their time in uniform is done, they're still serving their community. And I think that's another message that I, you know, I would, I love to get out there is if we are just nicer to each other and respect each other, my God, the things that we could get accomplished is mind boggling. Yes. So I just like to keep it positive and, you know, not dwell on all these bad things that have happened to me. Like, yes, being in a domestic violence situation is terrifying and it's sad and, you know, physically painful at times, depending on what's going on. And yes, I suffered four losses, but I can't dwell on that because I, I can put my message out there and maybe help someone else. And that's a positive. Yes. And again, all these other things have come from, you know, a bad situation. So it's just all about your perspective. I mean, you can, you can sit and dwell on things and be miserable, or you could turn it around and push forward. And, you know, uh, you don't, who knows what's waiting for you out there. <laughs> you just, know, I got to be in a parade and, you know, yes. wait, that was the best. <laughs> you had some great experiences on your other side. And that is, that is too cool. So if somebody wants to connect with you, Kristen, what are some ways that they can reach out to you? Um, so I do have, um, I have a personal Facebook page, um, which is my name, Kristen Leon. Um, but I also have a, prof a professional, I would say, Facebook page, which is Kristen L. So it's all one. So it's K-R-I-S-T-I-N-L. Um, and then Veteran Advocate on Facebook. And then I am on Instagram. I'm Xmas Lotus. Mm -hmm. And then what is my Twitter handle? I think it's at L4 Kristen is my Twitter <laughs> handle. Um, yeah, and that, and then I mean, they can, um, my breaking barriers is on rvntelevision.com. So, um, you know, I do speaking events at schools and um, women's clubs and, <clears throat> you know, like women's business clubs. And um, so I love to speak on, you know, my, my story, um, you know, motivating kids. Like I love speaking at schools and talking to kids. It's like one of my favorite things to do. Um, I've spoken at several veterans day events and usually I'm the only woman there, which I love. Um, yeah. <laughs> because it gives me more like fire to the girls. I'm like, listen, I know I'm up here with three other men, but do not let the men intimidate you. Please <laughs> trust me. Like, yeah, <laughs> I don't care if you're five foot three, like me, petite, you can still kick indoors and make stuff happen so literally true. and figuratively. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Kristen. It has been a pleasure talking to you about your story. Thank you for sharing it and for giving hope to other women who may have found themselves or may find themselves in, in a similar situation. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving me the space to tell my story. You're this is welcome. a great project that you have going. And like, again, allowing conversations to happen and giving people the time and space to learn about others and oh, I don't have it so hard. I, you know, maybe I should, you know, help someone who does. Like, yeah, yeah. And if you're interested in telling your story to Kristen, please connect with her on RVN television. She is phenomenal. We did a Zoom interview. So it is possible to, to tell your story wherever you're located. Very true. Yes. <laughs> All right. Take care, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay, so much. Good luck with everything. Thank you.